Let us move on, though, to Mary G. O'Sullivan. Today is a day of women with first names that are very similar. She's currently the director, deputy director of the Office of Policy Support and the Director of Intelligence. And prior to that assignment, she was the first chancellor of CIA University, director of support for th three years. In case you don't realize, but we do a lot of training in the government, not only in languages, but we deal with policy issues, we deal with economic issues, we deal with all kinds of counterterrorism issues. And to have a woman in this position is extremely important. And only Jay Garner could find her. So with that, again, I say welcome to you. And we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning. Um, I'm delighted to be in the company of so many accomplished women leaders here on the dais and to be a member of the Jay Garner Fan Club. And Connie and Lori, you've been neglected. Um, and I'm also delighted to see the great number of potential and actual leaders here uh, in the audience. Um, here's my goal this morning. I want to give each of you a takeaway. That is something that you're going to remember from this speech and that is going to guide you on your leadership journey. Now, because there is such a diverse audience here, that's an ambitious task. But I've always felt this way in my career. If you don't set a stretch goal, why bother? OK, women and leadership in the 21st century. Um, as Ambassador Elam Thomas said, I have worked um, on the analytic side of the agency for most of my career. And one of the first things we teach our analysts, particularly in the months long training sessions that we have for them, is to test every assumption that they have about a particular issue or a problem. Before you may put pen to paper, you must think about the inherent assumptions that are up here, that are guiding your thoughts. So what are my assumptions? I ask myself, let me put my analytic hat on. What are my assumptions about women in the 21st century and leadership? Well, I assume there are going to be more women leaders in the 21st century. But is that assumption based on progress to date or lack thereof? I don't know. So I said, let me get some data. So I asked the HR staff at the agency to run the numbers for me. And the news is very good at the CIA. The number of women in GS-14 positions, that's really the start of the managerial ladder, has doubled since 1991. In 1991, we started keeping track of the glass ceiling. We started looking at the numbers of women in executive and leadership positions. So good news, doubled since 1991. At GS-15, which is the top civil service grade before senior executive corps, the news is better. It's more than doubled. And it does get better. The number of women in the senior executive service has tripled since 1991, when we started looking seriously at the glass ceiling. So we have had tremendous progress um, at the agency. And so optimism is warranted. However, like all these other women who have spoken, we still have a long ways to go. Our senior executive core is still very heavily male dominated. And the numbers of women, even though our actual numbers have tripled, we are no more at parity um, than we really were several years ago. Actually, the ratio of men to women in the senior executive corps has stalled over the last eight years when I looked at the data. About approximately 44% of our workforce is female, but we are far from that at the senior executive levels. Only 27% um, of the senior executive corps are women. So, after having spent most of my career as an analyst for 27 years, I'm not foolish enough to try to extrapolate what the numbers are going to be like 15 years from now. I've just given you 15 years worth of data. Uh, nor am I going to try to project what the world is going to look like. Because last night I talked to Jay and Connie and I said, you know, if I was giving this speech in 1987, I probably would not have predicted the demise of the Soviet Union within such a short time. So I'm not going to do that, and I'm not going to tell you, all of you college students, what majors to pick either, OK? Uh, because most major shifts in jobs have really occurred because of technological breakthroughs that people didn't recognize. So if I was giving this talk in 1977, I probably would never have said, within the next five years, 
data punch entry operators would be extinct. You know, that used to be a very lucrative field when people used punch cards for computers to enter data. It disappeared in 1985. And I probably would not have also predicted in 1977 or 87 the huge impact of voice recognition technology on the field of telephone operators. And my mother started her career as a telephone operator, and there are many women who started out as telephone operators. That was really a great way, Ma Bell, to work for Ma Bell to get ahead. Okay, so I've just told you what I'm not going to do. So you're saying, well, what is she going to do? Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot of the backgrounds of 10 executive women. I interviewed 10 of my colleagues at the agency. Um, and there is really no one dominant field. So all of you who are communications majors or whatever majors you are, you can relax. I'll tell you what we don't need. I will tell you that. Uh, but for example, here's my advice to you. Pick a field or a major that you really enjoy, that you have passion about, okay? And then don't worry about your job because you'll eventually figure it out. For example, two of the women with whom I spoke were specialists in the Soviet Union. We had lots of them in the agency for like 40 years because that was public enemy number one. And we had experts on the Soviet military, the Soviet economy, the Soviet society, the Soviet technology, you name it. And in the 90s, they were all looking for work because the Soviet Union went away. So all of those Soviet specialists who were a dime a dozen then had to learn to reinvent themselves. And you'll hear this later on in my talk. I also interviewed an electrical engineer, these are all women, women senior executives, an electrical engineer, a civil engineer, an economist, a mathematician, and a German linguist, just to name a few. So you can see we have a wide variety of academic backgrounds in the agency. There are a couple fields that are not of interest to us. Please don't get up and leave the room if you are in one of these majors, though. <clears throat> okay. We generally don't hire people who have backgrounds in education. Um, even though I was chancellor of CIA University, what I'm really talking about is elementary and secondary education. We value your contribution. The best thing you can do if you are going to be an elementary or secondary school uh, major or teacher is to encourage your students, your students to learn about the world and to learn hard languages. Anybody here speak Dari, Farsi, Urdu? Give me your name. <laughs> we also don't particularly hire people who are in the fine arts. Okay. Although all of the graphic designers in the agency work for me. We do hire a tremendous number of graphic designers. We don't hire many musicians or painters, though. And we generally don't hire general sports and fitness professionals, although we have tons of nurses and doctors and other health professionals who work in our Office of Medical Services. So. Again, I still haven't told you what I'm going to do. Uh, what I'm going to do is try to describe the characteristics of great leadership. Um, and that really pertains to men and women. Now, these characteristics are my own, okay? Things that I've learned during my career. I've also observed. Listen to something like Yogi Berra. You can see a lot by watching. Okay, so I've observed a lot. And I also asked all of the women with whom I spoke. Uh, what were keys to their success? So here they are. This is my own stuff. I have to say this because I'm still a federal servant, civil servant, and so I have to say these remarks are my own, and they have, although they've been reviewed by the Central Intelligence Agency, they do not represent the official position of the Central Intelligence Agency. Okay, had to get that out of the way, so. Okay, the first characteristic, extraordinarily strong communication skills. Every single leader that I've observed has excellent communication skills. Now, I'm not talking charisma. I'm not talking sparkling personality. I'm talking the ability to write a clear, concise, to the point, effective memo. Number two, the ability to deliver effective briefings. And you've done your homework beforehand because you know the audience and what they might be interested in. And the ability to listen, to not be so convinced of the correctness of your position that you miss what other people have to say and you forget that it's better to lose this battle and win the war in the long run. Right, Jay? Okay. So there are some of you in the audience who say, oh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, just, I just don't like to get up in front of the public. Get used to it. 
If you can't stand up in front of an audience and communicate your vision and your good ideas, who else but you will know them? So, speak up, and for goodness sake, all you women in the audience, don't apologize first. Don't denigrate yourself and say, well, I don't know if anybody, don't. None of the senior executive women that I know ever, ever begin a sentence at a meeting that way. They speak their minds. All right, some of you are probably in technical fields because you said, I don't like to write. My advice to you, write, write, and write some more. Because good writing generally represents good thinking. Or it's actually truer, poor writing leaves the impression of the reader that you have poor thoughts, that they're jumbled up, and that you can't express yourself, and that you're muddle-headed. You don't want to give that impression. Okay, number two, commitment to values. And I'm going to tell a story about myself. There are quite a few stories here. A few months into my first managerial job, I realized I didn't like it. What was really worse, I didn't like my employees. That was pretty scary because I had decided the road upward was in the managerial track, and if I didn't like being a manager and I didn't like the people who worked for me, it was going to be a very long, arduous career. So I talked things over with my best advisor, who happens to be my husband. I've been married 41 years, so I have been able to combine a career and I have a family. Okay. And he helped me figure out that the reason I didn't like the employees was because they were doing things that were that contravened my core. They weren't pulling their weight, they weren't going the extra mile, and they were acting childish when things didn't go their way. And so I realized that I owed them and every employee, and I have this talk with every employee who's my direct report, I needed to tell them what was at my core because they, they deserved to know if they did these kinds of things, they were really going to be on my bad side. So in 1984, I wrote four things down. I get them out every year on New Year's Day. I look at them, and I see if I'm going to change any of them. They're still the same four things, and they're motherhood and apple pie, but here they are. Honesty, trust, teamwork, and personal growth. And the 10 women that I talked to almost all said the same thing. Sometimes they use slightly different words, but everyone said something similar. Sometimes they said honesty was, if I see my boss about to make a really big mistake, I speak up. Or I can tell people something without wounding them. Or I can handle bad news and deliver it to others. Yes, we women can be the hammer when necessary. Tough but fair is perfectly all right. And one of the first things I learned when I was a new manager was that I couldn't save everybody. And I fired somebody in my first six months as a manager, and that's very hard um, to do. It wasn't fun, but it was honest, and it was fair. He wasn't pulling his weight. His colleagues were going the extra mile, and that wasn't right. Other women colleagues of mine also mentioned integrity when I asked them about their values. They said they went home every evening and they looked in the mirror and they asked themselves whether the decisions they had made were consistent with their core values. Or would I be proud to tell my daughter what I did today if she had security clearances? <laughs> and almost every one of my interlocutors also talked about the pain of making someone unhappy in order to be true to themselves. It's not easy being a leader all the time. Third, be adaptable. I heard this from every woman. I have to tell you, more than once, I was asked to take a job that I didn't particularly want. And my mentor, who was a woman, I had many mentors, but this mentor, who was a, a woman, actually put my name in for a job in the controller's office, and she didn't tell me. And I got the job. I went into her office madder than a wet hen, and I said, I don't like numbers. I like people. I like languages. I like writing. And you know what she said to me? Sister, you need to learn to follow the money. You know what? She was right. I learned more in that job 
with numbers, and it has stood me in good stead ever since. Anytime there's a budget issue, they come to me. Another senior executive said, leave your comfort zone. I really made a name for myself because I always took on risky projects. They give you exposure, they open doors, they increase your network. Take a chance. My current boss, who is a woman, she was one of the Soviet experts. She mentioned, and one of you mentioned this, if a new job that you're about to take didn't scare you half to death, it wasn't worth taking. And that made me think about myself and smile. Another story. I was detailed to the Department of Defense in the late 80s, and it was time to come back to the agency. So I called up the head of the office, another woman, a very formidable woman. I called her up to negotiate my next job, and she came down to the Pentagon, actually, and we had dinner in the dining room there. I'd never met her before, but with the hubris of youth, I said, I want a managerial job, but I want a different kind than I had before. My first job, Helene, I said, I had all these new analysts, and I had to train them before they could ever do anything, and I don't want to do that. Been there, done that. Give me somebody experienced. She must have laughed all day when she gave me my next assignment. Here was my next assignment. I led a very specialized unit of physicians and clinical psychologists who outranked me significantly and chronologically. Last I looked, I had no MD or PhD behind my name. And moreover, on the very first day, every single one of them came in and told me how I could not possibly be as good as the woman who just left. So what to do? Well, I couldn't take a crash course in medicine or suddenly become 20 years older. So I spent some time, remember Yogi? You can learn a lot by watching. I had to figure out what I had that they needed. Or better said, how could I get a leg up on these jokers? <laughs> really seriously, how could I demonstrate that I, someone so junior and certainly not as skilled in the field as they were, how could I demonstrate that I was worthy of being followed? Well, after watching them, they were incredibly bureaucratically naive. And I was organizationally savvy. So once I demonstrated to them that I could navigate through the bureaucracy and get them what they wanted, it was okay. I was set. Okay. So, be scared, but trust yourself and trust in your own competence. Another characteristic, be known for something. Build a track record. One of the women with whom I spoke is an expert in conventional arms. Another of my successful friends is really known as somebody who can deliver. She can set a goal, think strategically and tactically how to get there, measure her progress, and almost every one of her jobs has been a first. She was the first chief of staff at the National Counterterrorism Center. She's the first chief of HR at the agency. So in each job, figure out what your unique contribution can be to the job and what your unique contribution, what you can learn from the job. Or, as a male friend of mine said, here's your goal. Your name should be first on the lips of every person around a table when there's a particular issue. Pick the issue, but you should be known as the go-to person. If there's a particular problem that they need to solve in this particular area, your name should be on everyone's lips. Now, as you move up the ladder, back to my theme of being adaptable here, um, things change, and being the go-to person means you have to learn a lot of new things. So the woman to whom I referred as the civil engineer, and that was her academic background, she went to Missouri School of Mines, uh, right outside of St. Louis. She hired on analyzing intrusion detection systems for ballistic missile silos. Okay, then her next job was designing high power, de high density power sources. And then her job was to design a computer system architecture. She's now the deputy director of science and technology for the agency. One of the Russian specialists, she started buying Russian books when she joined the agency. Then she took one of those budget jobs like I did 
and then she went into geospatial analysis, and now she is chief of HR for the agency. And so learning something new sometimes means going sideways. I've gone sideways plenty. I've also gone backwards. Okay, it's all right. The important thing is don't let your ego get too tied up in your job. So another personal story. Uh, I once was a presidential briefer. I was Bush 41's briefer, Mary Claire. So on my very first day of being the presidential briefer, I tell you, it did feel pretty swell to be in this fancy chauffeur-driven limousine going down the GW Parkway, through the gates of the White House grounds, going into the old executive office building and then into the Oval with the fancy briefcase. So that morning, and it's very early in the morning, briefings usually take place about 6.30 in the morning. So you have to get to work about midnight <clears throat> to get ready. So I went back to headquarters to write up my briefing notes, and I, I, was, I was feeling pretty full of myself, I have to tell you. I was a kid from St. Louis. I married really young. It took me 10 years to get my undergraduate degree. You remember those days I was driving, right? Okay, when we were stationed together at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I was on the road to Western Kentucky University. Anyway, it took me 10 years to get my degree, but just then the phone rang. My outside line. We have a lot of different lines. The outside line. And there was a small little voice on the other end, and it was my daughter, who was then about two years old. So, Miss Important Presidential Briefer heard this little voice say, Mommy, I just used the big potty. And I was brought right back down to earth because in the day-to-day -day scheme of things, that had more impact on my life <laughs> than that chauffeur-driven car, that swell job. <laughs> Though that job was pretty special. Okay. Uh, another characteristic, look for the good. Is every day going to be a honeymoon in your life or in your career? No. But if the leader isn't supportive of the mission and doesn't have passion for it, how will she inspire others? As my mentor, again, the same woman who put me in for that job in the controller's office, she was just recognized as a trailblazer of the agency for our 60th anniversary. She said, here's what leadership is about. Leadership is about getting people to tackle really hard problems and not hate you. And the leadership challenges do get harder the higher you go. The last thing I'm going to tell you is have energy. Being a leader is really hard work. It is physically and mentally exhausting. So take care of yourself, truly. Be physically fit. And I'm, I'm being very serious here because the days are very long. OK. And you have to be physically fit and mentally agile in order to build a sense of excitement among your followers. And I'm not talking you know, the peppy cheerleader type. If that's not your nature, that's false for you. But you do have to exude very positive vibes and have a sense of enthusiasm. And by all means, avoid cynicism. It is energy draining, and it spreads like wildfire. So if you are in a job and the people around you are cynical, head for the hills. Get out of Dodge. I don't want to end my remarks on a down note, but I did ask every one of my women interlocutors, what kept you from derailing? How did you keep moving upwards? And here's what they said. Don't be a workaholic. Find balance between work and your outside life. And by the way, have an outside life because if you don't, you're a really boring person. <laughs> know yourself and don't become so much like yourself as you move upwards. I'll tell you, we all get ahead because we're good at something, and whenever we're in a stressful situation, we tend to go back to that something that we're good at. But that's not always the right thing to do. And every one of the women with whom I spoke, when they said, don't become more like yourself as you become more senior, we had in mind a woman colleague. She was really, really excellent, and she had an eye for detail. She rose upward. There was more and more detail. So as she tried to master more and more detail. She spent longer and longer hours in the office. And then, because there was so much detail she couldn't possibly see it all, she hired lots of layers of staff to screen the detail so that she only got to see the most important detail.
And the end result really was a frustrated workforce, people with no initiative, and she got fired. As I said, we're all good at something, but don't fall back on your crutch all the time. Last, communicate, communicate, and then communicate some more. Articulate a clear direction and ask whether every decision that you've made is consistent with that direction and your values. And then remind folks once, twice, three times how the decision you just made was commensurate with your values and the direction in which you're going. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end with an acronym. It may sound a little like fluff, and this is not a fluff um, uh, gathering of women here, but sometimes just a little acronym can help you remember things. It's called POOF. P for positive. See the good in each job. Figure out what you can bring to it and what you can learn for it. So be positive. Be outward oriented, not inward oriented. Don't always worry about yourself. Worry about the organization. What does the organization need? What can you contribute to the organization? And for goodness sake, don't be a preservationist, meaning don't spend your career trying to preserve what you have because you will fail. Be organized in your thinking, speaking, and writing. Very few of these women up here are none of the women with whom I spoke just wing it. They prepare beforehand, not to the point of obsession, uh, but they're very prepared and planful. So positive, outward oriented, organized, and last but not least, focused. Be goal oriented, but don't become obsessed about a certain job or a single outcome and use that as your sole measure because you will likely be disappointed. Movement can be lateral as well as upward, and sometimes in my case, backward. So poof, positive, outward oriented, organized, and focused. And remember, all careers and all jobs have their frustrations. That's why they call it work. Thank you. Thank you.